The Buddha compares a skilled meditator to a skilled cook. The cook knows how to observe his master, in this case the king. He places many different kinds of food in front of the master, and then notices what kind of food does the king reach for, what kind of food does he praise, what does he eat a lot of. And the next day the cook will provide more of that kind of food without having to be told to. In the same way, as a meditator, you have to learn how to observe your mind. How does the mind like to settle down? When it does settle down, what's the breath like? Where are you settled? And what is the quality of your awareness? Each time you meditate, at the end of the meditation, ask yourself these questions. At what point was the meditation especially good? Try to notice those different features, and then see if you can recreate them the next day, the next time you meditate. Of course, there's more to that analogy. After all, kings can be fickle. They can like one thing today and not like it the next day. Which is why the cook has to prepare several different kinds of dishes as a backup. Be prepared for the fact that this king of your mind will have different moods. It also has to do with the needs of the body. Some days the body needs long breathing, some days it needs deep breathing, some days it needs short breathing. So you learn how to be sensitive. What does the body need now? And at the same time, you have to remember all your other skills. Say that the king likes banana curry today. Tomorrow you don't just place bananas and curry powder on the table. You go back and you do a really good job of fixing it, the curry. In the same way, as you come to meditate, remember a lot of it has to do with the attitude of the mind, the qualities of mind you're bringing to this. This is one of the reasons why John Sawat would say, make sure your mood is right, make sure your attitude is right as you're beginning to settle down and sit down and meditate. Here's where it's good to think about the basis of success that list of dhammas that the Buddha said was among his most important teachings, and what is given short shrift here in the West, because there's that attitude, there is no such thing as a good or bad meditation, there's just being with the present, whatever comes up. Or sometimes you hear that there's nothing to attain, just realize what's present. So why do you need all those bases for success? Well, the Buddha never taught any teachings that were superfluous, and he did talk about meditation as an attainment, as a skill that you master. You are bringing the mind to states of becoming in the concentration, and you want to think about the elements that go into that. The first, of course, is desire. All states of becoming are based on desire. And your concentration is going to be based on desire, too. But as the Buddha said, you have to fine-tune your desire. You have to balance it with patience. And patience doesn't mean just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for things to happen on their own. You encourage them, but you realize that there are certain things that have their own rhythm, have their own pace. The image they give in Thailand is of being a rice farmer. When you plant the rice, you have to be patient, which means you know it's going to take time. When the rice sprouts come an inch or two above the ground, you don't tell yourself, well, they should be a couple feet off the ground and then pull them up to make them that height. If you do that, you uproot them, and that's the end of the plant. You accept the fact that they're going to be small plants for a while, but that doesn't mean you just leave them. You nurture them. 
make sure they have enough water, enough fertilizer, make sure there are no ants coming into the field or mice coming into the field to eat the plants. The same way with your meditation. You want it to be going well. Then you have some ideas about what will go well from your past meditations. But you realize it's going to take a little time for the mind to settle down. So you protect the meditation. You're very careful not to let the mind wander off and take up with other desires. And you do what you can to help nurture a state of mind that's willing to settle down. Because sometimes even with the best breath, the best place to focus, the mind is going to be resistant. So you have to figure out what's going on inside the mind. Get it in the right mood. This comes under not only desire, but also persistence. You just stick with it. Here again, you have to know how much energy to put in. How much is too much, how much is too little. How strong your focus should be, how weak it should be. Tune it so it's just right. This relates to the third basis for success, which is intentness. You want to be fully intent on what you're doing. But not, too, not put too much pressure on it. Think of those hunters and trackers that go through the forest. They want to keep their eyes out for any signs of animals. So they have to develop what's called scatter vision, where you're fully intent on being just aware of your entire vis visual range. You're not focused on any one point to the exclusion of others, but you are intent on the whole range. This is the quality of concentration you want to bring. You are centered. But there's a softness around the edge of the center. So when you're focused on something, you're focused on relaxing it and allowing the breath sensations to spread, or allow the blood to flow throughout the body. But you're fully aware of the whole body. You're fully aware of the whole mind. Intently here but in a broad, expansive way. Then there's your powers of discrimination, analysis, ingenuity, everything that comes under that fourth basis for success, we monks saw. You do come with some preconceived notions about what's going to work, but then you also notice, is it working, is it not? And if it's not, what are you going to do? This is why I said it's good to have some backups, and to have in mind that the fact that the mind will have different needs on different days, the body will have different needs on different days. So how do you accommodate for them? You do your thinking, but again, it's balanced. It's not thinking that goes away from what you're doing. You use your powers of imagination and ingenuity, again, not to create as they call it, castles in Spain. But to figure out what else you might try. It turns out the king doesn't like banana curry the second day or doesn't like the same banana curry. What are you going to do to change the curry to make it more interesting? What other backup dishes do you have? And try to bring a matter-of-fact attitude toward this. When things do go well, try to simply note, okay, they're going well, and have a sense of being balanced right there. If you try to grab onto that nice mind state and ruin it, ask yourself, when you grabbed on, what went through your mind? And also, what sensations went through the body? Got established in the body. Can you release those and reset, and get back to where you were? Because if you're going to use your powers of analysis, you have to have a very matter-of-fact attitude. So when things are not going well, 
treat them matter-of-factly. When things are going well, you treat them matter-of-factly. That way your analysis is clear. And it's in this way that you get more and more clear about what's going on in the mind as you're creating this state of becoming. Because of all the states of becoming, this is the easiest one to notice, to analyze. So you can understand what it means to go into a state of becoming. And John Lee has a nice way of explaining it. He says it's like a path that you walk back and forth across day after day after day. Now, people who are not observant keep walking path back and forth, back and forth. Their minds will wander and they don't notice anything. But those who are more observant will begin to notice the different plants growing on the side of the path that, path that were not there the day before. But what about that line down there and further on the path? Is that a little trench? Is that a snake? What's going on? In other words, the fact that you're going over and over the same territory again and again should allow you to see the subtleties. And it's in seeing the subtleties that you become more observant. And you begin to see that even in a good state of concentration, there are certain things that can be improved. This is how it becomes a skill. And you're beginning to read it in terms of the three perceptions. You begin to see there's a certain inconstancy there. There's a certain level of stress. There are things you've got to let go of. This is how that basic quality of mindfulness, one of the three qualities you bring to an IE alertness, gets developed. And as John Lee says, mindfulness becomes knowledge. Your alertness becomes vision. We're heading towards knowledge and vision of things as they've come to be, the processes that go into becoming. So this is how it's done. It's done through mastering concentration as a skill, and bringing the full range of your powers of observation to so aware of the body all around, the mind all around. And that's how you become a really good cook. You're observant and you have a whole range of skills that you can draw on. And you begin to realize there really is such a thing as a really good meditation. Sometimes they may not start out so well, but the fact that you're willing to learn and observe, that's what makes the meditation good.